Hello, this is Catherine, as I know I need to stop talking. Hello, lovelies. What a day. I've just had my first COVID vaccine. I am so happy. I am so happy. I had a little cry. I was genuinely, I mean, all of the emotions. Oh my goodness me. I didn't expect it to be as emotional as it was. And I don't know if anybody else found it. I mean, I, I, I don't think I really knew what to expect. I turned up at the vaccine centre and I just everybody was was just lovely like absolutely everybody and to be fair I, I tend to find that with with the NHS generally but every single volunteer every marshal every clinician I mean just it was it was the most uplifting inspiring experience and oh my goodness I, I was saying to the girl who's checking me and I said you know can you imagine if you'd said to if someone had said to you this time last year in a year's time there'll be not one there'll be multiple ready to use safe effective vaccines that we here in the UK are are so unbelievably fortunate to a have access to but to be able to access those for free and and uh, you know I've I've always been in awe of the NHS and I, and I hope that I've you know you you've seen that in the, in the blog post that I write because I think it's so important that we appreciate what we have and everything that it does for us and I know it's not perfect and nobody's saying that it is but that privilege, that unimaginable privilege, and I, and I know for myself as, as somebody who's under the age of 40 and Touchwood is very, you know, healthy and, and, and generally fit without underlying conditions, I, I'm incredibly low risk. I didn't really expect to get, even when I heard there were going to be vaccines, I didn't expect one to have one this year. So, to have, you know, where are we now? May. And to have had my first, I mean, honestly, just the most humbling, unbelievable experience. I feel genuinely, uh, what a day. What a day. It's it's amazing. And, you know, for anybody who, who is concerned and, you know, and I know lots of people and have spoken to a few people who, who are grappling with real genuine phobias of needles. And I have so much, so much empathy for you in terms of that's that's such a difficult thing to overcome. But if it's in any way helpful, I genuinely didn't realise my vaccinator had put the needle in at all. So he's a lovely guy called called Michael. And we were laughing about the fact that he had to prop his glasses up on his head to be able to see what he was what he was doing. And he asked me which arm I put, I wanted to see, and I said my left arm. And he said, oh, well, you know, you could think of something nice or something now if you want to. And I was like, oh, honestly, I'm not bothered. I said, I, I donate blood. And, and for anybody who does donate blood, not that the blood donation needle is huge, but it's substantially larger than, than the needles that you use in a normal injection. So consequently, by the time you come to have like a normal jab, and I genuinely was like, I saw him throw something in the bed and I was like, what are you doing? And he said, it's done. And I thought he was, I he was like, you know, he's quite funny. I thought he was winding me up. No, he'd, he'd done the injection without me even noticing. Um, and, and then we chatted about my blog for a bit. So clearly, said, never, never miss an opportunity for self-promotion. That's what I always say. But, oh God, honestly, if, if you or anybody you know have been in any way involved in the incredible efforts, right, right from first conceptualising a vaccine through to the trials and the research and the rollout. And if you volunteered or marshaled or, or vaccinated, I mean, just all of you. They're, they're genuinely, and I'm saying this now with tears in my eyes again, seriously, I need, I need to get hold of myself, but honestly, I, I genuinely, that there, there are no words, no words to thank you. Um, it's been some incredibly bleak months, and it's been an incredibly difficult period of time to live through, going through the pandemic. But there have also been those those incredible, incredible moments. You know, we, we've made history here, we've lived through history, and as I say, no, no words sufficient to thank the people who, God willing, will, will, will help us find a, find a route, route out of this. So yeah, absolutely no words. I mean, obviously everybody who's had a vaccine loves to tell you all the horror stories about the side effects. I now get to wait for those, but frankly, I, I, I don't, I don't care. I feel so privileged to have it. I say this now, roll on next week's podcast and I'm like, couldn't get up for a week. I've, I've been warned lots of people's arms get, get very sore. So my, my concession to that is I'm going to wash my hair tonight rather than tomorrow morning. Always focusing on the priorities must remember to 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 wash my hair but yeah oh my goodness amazing amazing day it's been a bonkers week I mean obviously this is me so most of the time my life generally is bonkers it, it feels like it's been excessively bonkers this week so I mean Jamie gotta love him he's been he's been through the emotional roller coaster this week so oh I, I just love him so I'm sat at home working on Thursday morning it's about quarter past nine I've just dropped Jamie at school and I get an email from the school followed by a text saying urgent. So I open up and read it and someone in Jamie's bubble at school has had a positive lateral flow test. And so Jamie and another small collection of students have to understandably get collected as soon as possible to self-isolate 
until such time as either they this person has a PCR test and it's negative or, you know, 10 days pass and then they can get back to school. I mean, Jamie has been waiting for this to happen since the schools reopened. I am not going to lie. Obviously, as, as lots of you know, he's he's lived his absolute best life during the pandemic. So I I texted him and, you know, kind of obviously checked he knew what was going on. He did. I said, right, I'm going to come to school to get you. His school's got a really long driveway. So I, I drove in. They had a, a marshal there. I explained that I'd come for Jamie. And he's like, all right, just go and park up there. We'll let him know that you're here. So I'm parked up and I'm looking in my rear view, <laughs> rear view mirror and Jamie, you know, is, is like, he's, he's a typical teenager. He's, he's not sullen at all, but, you know, he can be fairly expressionless. He's walking down the drive and even from a distance, I can just see the biggest fuck off smile on his face imaginable. He is beaming, absolutely beaming. He gets in the car, go, are you happy? He's like, oh, mum. He said, it's just brilliant. He said, it's so good. I feel like it might be a dream. So, so we got home and yeah, got home. And, and to be fair, you know, he's, he, I mean, amazing. God, the teacher's amazing. I'd already put some work online. So he sat and did that. And he just sloped around the house and played with the cats and um, lived, basically lived his, lived his best life. I, I was telling my work colleagues on a call that I had, I was telling them, I said, oh, you know, Jamie's, Jamie's back at home. He's got to self-isolate. And one of my work colleagues, because of course they, they, they got to know the kids because clearly we've all slightly lived in one another's houses over this weird period of, of remote working. One of one of my work colleagues, he said, ah, oh, so is, is Jamie going to be now back into his, his typical lockdown attire of basically just being wrapped in a duvet? Because on various meetings over the last few months when the schools were, were shut, it was a standing joke that halfway through, Jamie would just shuffle behind me wrapped in, in nothing but a duvet, which pretty much was what he wore for the entire of lockdown. So, so yeah, so that, so that was Thursday and he's like, oh, it's just, it's just amazing, mum. It's just amazing. Anyway, Friday morning, I wake up and I see I've got a text on my phone and I then have, well, actually, I made Mr. I know I need to stop talking to her. I made Mr. I know I need to stop talking, go and break to Jamie the unhappy news that the person who had the positive lateral flow test now had a negative PCR test, which is the definitive COVID test. And so Jamie would be going back to school. I mean, to be fair to him, he was a very, very good sport about it all. He said, at least I had that one day, mum. And I think he'll forever remember that one day coming out of school, beaming from ear to ear, getting into the car going, so brilliant mum it just feels like it feels like it might all all just be a dream um god god love him so so yeah so that was the the emotional roller coaster on the same mornings all that shit was going down so some of you might have seen on the on the blog um oh god cats are twats aren't they i mean i i, I do love them cats are cats are absolute twats actually a friend of mine was telling me how her cat has started returning every night every night like consecutive nights with a warm chicken leg in its mouth so it's going somewhere somebody's dinner every every night you can imagine someone in the house going oh i'm just gonna sit down for my dinner turn away turn away turn back what the fuck where's my chicken leg the cats had it but we woke up this week and i always get up and before i go sort of into the bathroom just check on the children and then i i, I walk past the top of the stairs and you know when you do a proper genuine double take you're like okay, everything's fine and you're like what the fuck is that and I look down the stairs and I can only describe it as it looks like we've had the world's most fucked up burglary involving some kind of smash and grab on a Greg's Bakery because on the stairs, literally from top to bottom, are strewn pieces of bread and plastic, clear plastic. So so it's not hard to figure out who the culprit is because ASAP, it's always ASAP, sat right next to me going, look, look what I did. So she has clearly, in the middle of the night, decided to scale the, to scale the side of the house, come in through our bedroom window, as she often does, go downstairs, get onto the kitchen side, open the bread bin, open the bread bin, get out the sealed packet of six bread rolls, drag them to the stairs, because who the fuck even knows why, rip them open and disembowel them. So I spent, yeah, a large percentage of the time that I didn't have trying to remove crumbs from my, from my car. She doesn't even like fucking bread. That's the thing. It's such a dick move. I, if it was like, I don't know, smoked salmon, though I, I would get it. But, but bread, that's just, that's just being a dick, isn't it? That's just being a dick. So yeah, yeah, we had, we had that. So that was, that was nice and surreal. My other brilliantly surreal moment this week, I was chatting to Beth. So so I, I try to talk to my kids about, about big topics, not like in big chunks, but just as and when it comes up. And I talk to them about the stuff that, that's important, like, you know, blood donation is something that's that's really important to me. And they will make their own choices. They might decide they don't want to be blood donors, but I want them to know why I think it's a good thing so that they can make a, a measured decision. 
And so I was chatting to them, I'd been chatting to them previously about organ donation. And, and Jamie was like, yeah, absolutely. And no brainer. Yeah, of course, more than happy to donate my organs. And Beth was like, no way. And she was quite little at the time. And, and I would never push the topic anyway. And it's, it's her body, her choice. So I was like, okay, fair enough. But I was revisiting. I've revisited it with her a couple of times since. As I say, not putting pressure on, just, just trying to understand why. And she and she just closed it down. She's like, no way. And I, and I thought, well, probably she doesn't want to talk about it. So fair enough. Anyway, she brought it up uh, the other day. And so I said to her, I said, so Beth, I said, you know, organ donation, you know, is it is it something you, you think you might change your mind on? You know, it's your choice. Just interested to know the reasons why. And she looked at, she looked at me with a steely gaze. She went, I need my organs. I said, yeah, I know you need them now, but, you know, as and when you die, you're not going to need them then. She went, what do you mean? And I said, well, when you die. And she went, is that when they take the organs? I said, yes, when did you think that they take them? She's like, I thought they just came and got them when they needed them. I was like, oh my God, what kind of weird Dr. Frankenstein world are you living in where people just rock up? God, that'd be terrifying, wouldn't it? Live organ donations and you'd never know when people would just rock up to take your organs. It reminds me of the time me and my dad were <laughs> once... <laughs> Me and my dad were once getting a train back late. We'd been to London. We'd been out for dinner in London and it was, it was years ago. And we were coming back to the train. We'd had, we'd had a couple of glasses of wine to drink, but, you know, we, we were on the train coming back. And I can't remember which one of us came up with it, but one of us came up with this concept of, wouldn't it be terrifying if every time you got onto a train, you knew that at some point in that train journey, one of the passengers in that train carriage, something was going to turn up and eat that person. But you never knew which passenger it was going to be. So you never knew if it was going to be you. I literally don't even know. I don't know what's wrong with us both that we came up with this. We were killing ourselves laughing the entire way. And every new passenger who got on, we were like, could be them. Um, I, yeah, I, it clearly runs in the family, doesn't it? It clearly runs in the family. But but yeah, so so now Beth understands that the organ donation is not carried out while, you, while you're alive. Funny enough, she's, she's, she's quite up for it now so um yeah god the things you take for granted eh it's um she's she's deeply suspicious deeply deeply suspicious but but i thought you know the nhs i mean just in celebration of the nhs i haven't done a podcast on the nhs i mean that's i i've always been such a firm advocate for the nhs and and you know with the with the usual caveats it isn't perfect and to be honest show me any kind of entity which is perfect when it's experienced the levels of successive underfunding and asset stripping that that, that government after government have, have sort of put upon it but it is it is amazing um and and i kind of had a little little trip down down memory lane think it thinking of i mean the nhs has been there for, for me and my family and as i'm sure it has all of us so many times but i got to think about the more entertaining times that the, <laughs> the nhs has been there for me um because it made me made me smile i mean right from when i was little this was less entertaining but i had febrile convulsions when i was a kid which must have been terrifying for, for my parents and and at the time my mum wrote a a report for I don't know whether it was the NCT or she, anyway, she she wrote like an article, which is, you know, kind of cool. Well, obviously very frightening for my parents to experience it, but really interesting to sort of see, you know, what they did and how they coped with it. The bit that sticks out for me from that report was when my mum writes, then, you know, it was clear that Catherine was feeling better in hospital when she was charging up and down the ward, making animal noises. And reading that now as an adult, and an adult who's not very tolerant of small children, I'll be honest, all I think now is fucking hell. If I'd been on that ward and some little kid was charging up and down making animal noises, I'm really sorry if you happened to be on that ward sometime in 1982 and some little shit was charging up and down nonstop making animal noises. I'm really sorry that was me. That was, that was me. I also I've had three febrile convulsions. I also dislocated my elbow twice when I was a kid. And I think the first time, I think I wanted to go in one direction and my mum wanted to go in another direction and she was convinced her way was right and I knew that she wasn't and I thought well I'll prove this to her and I'll go the other way and unfortunately it ended up proving to me that it was a bad idea to try and walk in a completely different direction for the person who's holding your hand but actually the second time I did it I can vaguely it's one of my earliest memories it's faded a bit now but I can remember I was sitting on it was a white chair wooden chair in the room where my sister Helen she had her cot so it must have been like bedtime and because of the logic of toddlers because toddlers are fundamentally dicks a bit like cats i remember thinking i'm going to see how far around the arm of this chair i can twist my arm and surprise surprise 
and you know spoiler alert for anybody who's thinking of trying the same don't because it turns out less than a turn and a half and your elbow dislocates so yeah nhs sorted me out put me back together then so 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 well done then i mean it starts to all get more 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 even more ridiculous as i get into into my teenage years now those of you who followed the blog for a long time will know i do love a pair of ridiculous heels and that that penchant started when i was oh god i don't know i mean early mid teens i guess but one of my more memorable encounters with the nhs was when i was i think i was about 16 and i was wearing absolutely wildly unsuitable shoes i'm also really not very coordinated so you would think that my lack of coordination and and you know you think you go well don't wear high shoes don't do that but i am i am nothing if not stubborn and optimistic that maybe my clumsiness will have disappeared and i'll turn out to be really coordinated and i can tell you now that no no that is almost never the case and so i was going to a rehearsal i was doing a show at the time i was going to rehearsal and i was walking up from the station staggering slightly in these wildly unsuitable shoes and a friend of mine turned came around the corner in in the, in the car with his dad and, and I waved enthusiastically to them and sort of you know thinking how oh, good they'll, they'll stop and they'll give me a lift and and they did and they, they stopped and I was like this is fantastic and then confidently I convinced myself I could run in these shoes run I don't literally don't know what the fuck I was thinking I could barely stand upright in these fucking shoes and so I attempted to run and I basically plunged off the side of the curb and fell to the ground and, and completely did that thing that I think lots of us do when we fall and we really badly hurt ourselves. And we go, it's fine, it's fine, I'm fine, oh my God, look at me, I'm such an idiot, I'm fine, I'm fine. Well, like tears are forming in my eyes thinking, fuck, I don't know if I can actually use my foot. So I kind of limped into the car and, and somehow got through the rehearsal. And then I remember getting home and then getting up the next morning and trying to get out of bed and trying to stand on that foot and it was like the pain and the fire of a thousand suns burned and resonated through it. And I was like, fuck. Um, and so I said to my mum, understanding the year, I think I've hurt my foot. And uh, I was somewhat prone to melodrama. I know, hard to believe, right? Me, prone to, prone to melodrama. Total aside here, but this is a great story. My mum and dad still tell of the morning when I must have been about 12, 13. For whatever reason, I decided that I didn't want to go to school. I can remember this really well. I wasn't really poorly. I just didn't want to go to school. Now, as a parent, I understand what a ball ache it is when your child doesn't want to go to school. I must have been younger because I know I couldn't have been left on my own. So yeah, 11 or 12, maybe. And I can still remember and then going, well, no, you're fine, Catherine. Go and brush your teeth and get your uniform on and then we'll see how you are. You know that really annoying thing that parents do? And I can still remember my dad hadn't gone to work because he was, you know, sort of trying to talk to me about, you know, I'm sure you're fine and everything. And I can remember walking into the living room and basically doing, my dad describes it as me collapsing in some kind of Lady Macbeth-esque faint in the middle of the living room floor, which obviously it was very obvious that I was completely faking it. And at that point, my mum and dad left the room and I sort of lay there in my pretend faint thinking, yes, this is it. I've, I've, I've got them. I've fooled them now. And it turned out they'd both had to go outside the back door to stand in the garden because they were laughing so much they couldn't keep straight faces. Uh, needless to say, I went to school. But yeah, that, that's a great story. Anyway, so so I digress. So, so my mum, on the morning of the foot injury, my mum could not be blamed for, for thinking perhaps that this was another moment of melodrama. But I think when she saw me having to slide down the stairs on my bottom like a baby, she realised something was awry. So she very kindly took the morning off work in order to take me to the hospital where they x-rayed my leg and proclaimed that I had torn all the ligaments in my foot. And they said, how did you do that? And I really wanted to have like a really good thing. Like I was I was, I was saving a, a, a drowning kitten or I was like running to catch the last bus to my really important job where I save lives. And instead I had to say I was dicking about on wildly unsuitable shoes and I fell off the pavement. They were still very nice. And that's what's brilliant about the NHS is they're still incredibly supportive regardless of whether or not you've been a bit of a dick so that was when i was 16 but that pales into insignificance in terms of embarrassing injuries compared to when i was 18 oh god so i've got a scar on my face it's it's a very small scar it's just above my upper lip and it happened on easter day easter day when i was 18 and we had to go my mum took me to hospital god poor my mum i don't know why my dad wasn't taking me to hospital he's probably busy laughing at these ridiculous injuries my mum took me to hospital and they had to stitch up the injury on my lip which i had managed to get are you ready for this managed to get by dropping a tin of tomatoes on my face i genuinely don't even know what my life is when you go in and they're like how did you do this and again you want to say like oh i was you know defending myself against an intruder i was like drops of tomatoes on my face and they're like what 
Drop some tomatoes. You drop what on your face? Tomatoes. Tomatoes? They're in a tin, all right? They're in a tin. It really fucking hurt. The tin was in a high cupboard and I'd, it rolled on. I was using the tins for weights and they'd rolled on top of a cupboard that kind of lifted up and then it, I went down and the tomato fell on my face and um, my lips split open. And yeah, I mean, what's wrong with me? Who gets an injury from dropping tomatoes on their face? What an absolute dick. So yeah, I, I mean another another great comedy NHS moment that that was was stressful at the time, but in hindsight is very funny. Is one Friday night and Jamie, who's generally pretty healthy, suddenly dropped to the ground in agony. And and as all parents know, when you see your child in pain, it's the worst thing ever. Um, it, it came out of nowhere. We were like, shit, he's grabbing his tummy. He's like, I'm in so much pain. I'm in so much pain. I'm like, shit, we better take him to, we need to take him to hospital, we need to take him to hospital quickly. Luckily, very lucky we got a hospital that's like, I don't know, seven minutes down the road, it's really near. So I got Jamie into the car, he's clutching his stomach, I gave him a bowl, he needs to be sick. I was like, it's all right, sweetheart, don't worry, we're going to get you there, the doctor's going to see, he's going to be absolutely fine. He's like screaming and crying, loads and loads of pain. I'm driving with a pure sweat on, like, oh my goodness, you know, let's get to hospital, blah, 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 blah. Speed up into the car park, pull up, and I literally, I pulled into the space. I was in the space, I pulled into the car park. He suddenly sat up straight and looked at me and went, I feel all right now. I said, what do you mean? You were in screaming agony a moment ago. He said, honestly, it was the worst pain ever, Mum. He said, I'm fine. Should we go home? I said, we're not bloody going home. We're here now. We're going to get you checked out. So we went in. And again, you know, a and is always amazing, but paediatrics A&E is particularly, particularly brilliant. The staff are, are unbelievable. Went in, explained the situation. I, I said, I, you know, I'm very sorry. This is, this is a little bit embarrassing. Obviously, he seems fine now. And they said, no, no, quite right to come in. And the the nurse practitioner had a look at him, the doctor had a look at him, and and there's something that I think I don't even remember what it is, but part of your intestine can can swivel, switch, turn around on itself. You can tell I'm not a doctor, can't you? Anyway, it can do that, and then it can flip back. So she said it, it can be quite normal. It can happen. Just keep an eye on it. Blah 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 blah. She said it could be a tummy bug. I mean, I didn't want to ask her, and I still to this day, and I've said to Jamie, "You sure this wasn't what it is?" And he's like, "It could be." I still wonder whether actually what happened is we pulled into that car park, he had a massive fart and suddenly felt better, but she didn't suggest it, so I wasn't going to come out with, do you think it was just a really big fart? <laughs> Again, those seven years of medical school, you can tell that I, I, I didn't didn't cover cover that particular particular course. Obviously, when you have kids, the NHS is amazing. They're amazing for looking after when kids get poorly, but they're also fucking amazing when you have to get the kid out of you in the first place. I mean, it's such a fucking flawed procedure, childbirth, isn't it? And, you know, the, the joy of, of, of drugs on tap, basically. All the drugs you can get. And even when you're like... I mean, I was I was not very reasonable when I was having either of my children. And to be fair, I hadn't slept for a week both times, so I defy anybody to be fucking reasonable when they haven't slept for a week and they're forcing a bowling ball out of their vagina. And I was, yeah, very, very unhappy with, with the situation. The staff were like so nice and so amazing and gave us all of the, uh, gave us all of the drugs. It was me doing the pushing, gave me all of the drugs. And it was, yeah, I, I, it was amazing. And, and to just go through that experience and not even have to think about, can I afford this? Can I afford to pay for this? Can I afford, you know, the Jamie example, okay, he ended up being fine. But for me, it was a no-brainer. Well, he's really poorly. I need to get him to hospital. I mean, I cannot imagine, particularly as a parent, what it must be like to go through that. Can I afford to get the medical care that my child needs? I, I just can't imagine it. And although we've done like you know, we've we've done comedy moments today because because that is that is my nature is to focus on the on the funny, right? There's the NHS has helped us out in some terrifying, terrifying moments when to rush Beth to the hospital they actually thought she had appendicitis and she oh she was so she was so ill she was so ill it actually turned out to be scarlet fever amazing on-call GP at the weekend when she was in and out eventually diagnosed her but they're amazing there at the time when Jamie was about three and he came home from nursery and he just couldn't use his legs like literally tried to put him on his feet and he crumbled to the floor and we went in and he had some hip inflammation thing. We had to stay the night and that, that moment of having to hold him down while they had to do the, the sample biopsy from his from his hip oh, will stay with me forever, forever. But but you know how how wonderful and amazing that we 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 are living in a country where we're we're able to access that kind of care. When Mr. I know I need to stop talking's dad suddenly completely unexpectedly, this was years ago now, this is what, twenty years ago, maybe? yeah, not too far, 20 years ago, just collapsed one day and was rushed to hospital and had had a critical brain hemorrhage. And we were actually told at the time that he would either die or he would be very severely brain damaged. And I wasn't sure if I believed in miracles before them, but when 
we got the phone call a couple of days later to say incredibly thanks to the treatment he'd received he would make a full recovery and he has made a completely full recovery it's fucking unbelievable you know it is amazing and the people working and whether you're frontline nhs or back office nhs or you know your support staff or your cleaners or porters or play therapists or, or anybody anybody making our nhs work in, in you know in, in the backdrop as i say against this these funding cuts and and the general lack of support so many of our governments have given it it is it is incredible it is unbelievably humbling to have such a thing one of my favourite favourite singers, Joni Mitchell, and and the line that she sung that always makes me think of our NHS, which is, don't it always seem to go, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. They paved paradise, they put up a parking lot. And if you are passionate about our NHS, or indeed if you're cynical about why do we need an NHS, I would urge you to watch a film called Sicko, which is made by the American documentary maker Michael Moore, who's a controversial figure, but he makes some bloody great documentaries. And Sicko focuses on the American healthcare system and I know what you're thinking because you're probably thinking well, okay well it's going to focus on the people who don't have health insurance it does briefly look at those people but what it actually then focuses on is those people who have health insurance and are still facing crippling bills bankruptcy and losing their homes to pay for the essential medical care that they need and I struggle to imagine how anybody could watch that and not be in favour of something like the NHS because, my God, the alternative is fucking terrifying. And I'm always massively grateful when I do write posts on the NHS and we get people who come and comment who live in the States or have lived in the States and they share their experiences and always, always say, you guys are so lucky. You are so lucky. And we are. We are so, so lucky to have our, our brilliant NHS. So to everybody who works for our NHS... Thank you all so, so much. And thank you for my sticker today as well. I got a sticker. I'm so excited that I got a sticker with my vaccine. I mean, like, as if a vaccine's not good enough. And then you get a fucking sticker. And who doesn't love a sticker? Well, my dad went for his vaccine really, really early on in the process. He's very lucky to get his early. And he went and he, he had his vaccine. And then he jokingly said to the said to the vaccinator and and said you do lollipops now and she sort of looked at this 60 something man and was like no sir we don't do lollipops but you can have a sticker so i knew there were stickers available and i did indeed get my sticker today and i'm very very happy wear it with with fucking pride what a day what a day anyway obviously after vaccines what they say is that you should like really try and relax and take it easy and stay hydrated and and basically do nothing that's stressful which is why i've allowed beth to have a sleepover with one of her best mates tonight i mean you should see the room I'm sitting in now. This is why I always record my podcast. Usually, it's a relatively quiet haven. It's got my desk. It's got a sofa in. It's got our massive drinks cabinet next to me, which is, you know, very motivating for getting through podcasts on a Saturday night. And it's got like a little TV, but it's it's usually pretty tidy. I mean, today it looks, I, d- I don't even know where to begin. Basically, they've turned what feels like the entire room into a den and I got back from my vaccine. I said to Mr. I know I need to stop talking. The girl's been all right. He said, yeah. He said, I mean, you know, obviously they briefly tried to, to, to burn the house down. I said, what? He's like, yeah, they tried to put the, the blankets over, over all of the lights in the room. And couldn't, and couldn't understand why that might be an issue. So, yeah, I'm going to enjoy that really, really relaxing, relaxing evening with um, with Beth and her mate. But, yeah, I hope everybody's doing OK. I hope, you know, now that now that we can see people inside, I've suddenly there's a whole like group of people that I now feel willing to see because much as I love them. Fuck me, May's been cold, hasn't it? And I just think, you know, I love you very, very much but not enough to sit in a pub garden with you in the pissing, pouring rain. But now we can meet inside. It's it's a whole new world. So I hope you're getting to do some lovely things. I hope those of you who haven't had your vaccine yet get called up to have them very soon. Don't forget to ask for a sticker. The sticker is totes the best bit. A massive thank you again for me to every single person involved in that vaccine effort. And top tip for today, if you've got tinned tomatoes anywhere near you, for fuck's sake, don't let them fall on your face. It really, really fucking hurts. Have lovely weeks. Look after yourselves. Take care. I will see you next week. Lots of love. Bye-bye.